You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Are you a CEO looking to scale your company faster and easier? Check out Thrive Roundtable. Thrive combines a moderated peer group mastermind, expert one-on-one coaching, access to proven growth tools, and a 24-7 support community. Created by Inc. award-winning CEO and certified scaling-up business coach Bruce Eckfeldt, Thrive will help you grow your business more quickly and with less drama. For details on the program, visit Eckfeldt.com slash Thrive. That's E-C-K-F-E-L-D-T dot com slash Thrive. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeldt. I'm your host. And our guest today is Jonathan Keekbush. He is Managing Director at I2W and also of SEO Butler. We're going to talk to him about how to build your business by generating more audience, generating more activity, top of funnel. How do we really amp up sales by getting out there and figuring out how to get more leads, how to turn those leads into clients, how to make sure that we're getting better clients. Always, I think, a challenge uh, for every company who's trying to scale, but certainly for services, this can often be a real constraint. It can really kind of hold a company back and get, getting this right can really be a game changer, can really kind of unleash the growth of a company. Uh, so I'm excited to have the conversation. I always find that it's not easy. <laughs> and there's usually some strategic questions you got to get right too, but you know, knowing the strategies, knowing how um, uh, what options are out there in terms of marketing, in terms of kind of really growing awareness and growing leads into the business is going to be key. With that, Jonathan, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Bruce. Yeah, thanks for being on. So before we kind of dig into you know marketing and SEO and how to generate leads, let's learn a little bit more about you, your backstory, how you got into this business. Tell us, how did things start for you? Sure. Let me try and condense it down so we don't <laughs> spend the whole half an hour. I'll give you the cliff notes. I, yeah. I hide it extremely well, but born and raised in Berlin and Germany, and I actually left Germany when I was 16. Um, okay. I, I, I dropped out of school and I, um, I moved to India of all places. Wow. I was, I was like, I, I, you know, I want something different. I want to just get away and, and sort of figure stuff out. Mm-hmm. Uh, while I was out there, that was the first time I really got introduced to like tech and IT, which is bizarre because, you know, yeah. early days India was very behind in, in a lot of ways. But I got introduced to web design and that kind of stuff. And again, I promise to keep this short. So I left India three years later and I got the opportunity to move to the UK because I was headhunted by this British business that Mm -hmm. um, wanted me to do sales for them. And one of the prerequisites was that I could sell to the Dach countries, which is Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So Uh speaking German, that I could work with their Indian back office. Well, I'd just come back from India. And (laughs) and this parole was perfectly designed for you. (laughs) It was literally designed for me and that I'd be willing to move to the UK. And I was like, well, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll take that. (laughs) Um, So I moved over and I was with that company for one and a half years. And it was amazing. You know, I went from account executive to director of sales for Europe. But the problem is that this was around 2008 and the bubble had burst, obviously, in the US. And, and, you know, it it was tough. These guys had seven offices in the US and just one in the UK. And we took a huge hit. And so to cut a long story short, I was was made redundant. And um, so I really, I was kind of sick of it. You know, I had also been commuting into London and it was like being in a big smoke and and just Mm -hmm. busy, busy, busy. And so I I was like, I want to do something totally different. And I started a security company, actually, like physical security. Interesting. And I saw this, I saw this opportunity in the market where in the UK, the physical security business was still dominated by the sort of big, aggressive guys that weren't suitable for all the the requirements that were out there. So I started what I called a boutique security company. And so we took on uh, jewelry chains, we took on high end events like polo games and like catwalk events and stuff like that, where they just wanted people to be a little bit better presented and, and that kind of stuff. We did some bodyguarding and surveillance and all of that exciting stuff. And I did that for the best part of three years and built that up from the ground. And 
I enjoyed the work, but I hated the business. Mm. It's a very tough business to run. You know, yeah. you're dealing with, on the one hand, very unreliable staff, and on the other hand, very difficult to deal with clients. Yeah. Clients yeah. that want the world, but will pay, you know, six months late and that kind oh. of stuff. So, Nightmare. And I know. And so yeah. towards the end of that journey, I started looking back at the tech world and going, I really want to get back into this, but I want to do it right. I don't want to be employed. I really have enjoyed working for myself in the security business. And I was just starting to look for opportunities. And so there was this guy that I'd done a couple of projects with that was uh, an SEO guy. And I was like, man, there's got to be an opportunity in that market. And so we, we actually started initially with a content writing service because that mm -hmm. was the gap in the market that we'd found. And um, we were actually serving other marketers. So we yeah. were like, what do all of these marketers need and what do they struggle to sort out? And one of those things was content. And so we just hired some freelance writers and helped the, the clients scope stuff up and help the writers organize the work basically. And we were just in the arbitrage of sitting in between and connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. And from there, it just grew. We started adding more services and then eventually we found the, the SEO agency. And then a couple of years ago now, I actually bought that partner out of the business. And, um, and here we are today with SEO Butler being sort of our productized service business that I always call the marketer's back office because marketers can kind of utilize it to get all the services that they can't do in-house. And then we've got our own agency, which um, works just sort of, you know, B2B helping businesses market themselves on the internet. Yeah, I mean, I love, I love those business models, which are sort of the back office or, or taking all the kind of heavy lifting stuff off of, you know, more of the client facing agencies and figuring out how to, you know, really optimize it, you know, figure out the process, find the right people and be able to just then service all these different agencies who, in the end, I always find what the agencies are really good at is client services, right? I mean, they did servicing the client, figuring out what they need. They're, mm -hmm. they're not so good at delivery sometimes. <laughs> It's so and, true. and so, and then so you do, you just figure out, okay, like I know, you know, sometimes an account needs this service, sometimes it doesn't. So it's hard for them to keep really good mm -hmm. talent on staff. Well, can I just abstract that out and then service the agencies who, you know, mm -hmm. on average, they're all going to need services on a regular basis. It's just this, it might go to this client one time and another client another time. So interesting. And so, I mean, I, as someone who clearly looks at kind of opportunity or looks at a market or looks at an industry and kind of finds the unmet needs, I mean, how, how, how did you sort of see the world of kind of SEO, I guess, break down the world of, of SEO or the kind of the components of SEO and figuring out where, how you decided to kind of approach it? Because there's, there's a lot of SEO companies out there. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people sort of mm -hmm. doing quote unquote SEO services. But was it by the nature of the service, the industry that you're focused on? How did you kind of, you know, slice it up? I'll be honest with you. The first step that we took into that market was actually really by the, the lamest market research, to be honest with you, we joined every SEO Facebook group that we could yeah. find and we just read everything, right? <laughs> and we just, we just looked for what are people asking for the most. And one of the things that kept coming up is people being let down by individual freelance writers, right? And so that was the initial sort of light bulb moment where we're like, People need a lot of content. If you think an agency has, let's say, just 20 clients in their local businesses, and yeah. as part of their SEO package, they're promising just, say, I don't know, three blog posts a month. Well, that's that's 60 pieces of content already <laughs> yeah. that they need to organize. And a lot of these guys do not have writers on staff. So they go out and they find these individual freelance writers and they work with them. But there's obviously probably tens if not hundreds of thousands of those types of agencies out there. And so a lot of these people were struggling because the writers were working on content in their free time and then, you know, something better would come along or they got busy. Yeah. And so we were like, well, wait a minute. If we, instead of having one writer work on one project, if we can have, you know, 20 writers work on these projects spread out, then we mitigate the risk for the end client and we can deliver a more consistent product overall. And there's definitely margin in there as well. So that's kind of where we started. And then we just started to listen to 
what our clientele were telling us that they were also needing to basically to, to complete the package, so to speak. And so that's when we started adding link building, etc. What was funny is that we never set out to start an SEO or marketing agency. <laughs> it was something that came out of people saying, yeah. you already do this and this and this for me. Can you just do the rest as well? And yeah. we're like, ah, we say it, we said no so many times and eventually we said yes. <laughs> well, and that's an interesting one because I think that's, in, in some respects, that's the crux of the challenge for most service companies is sort of figuring out what do I, you know, what should I do? What, should, what do I create focus, right? So I can create scale and I can create differentiation and things like that. But also, how do I take advantage of these new opportunities? And I, I, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's a huge struggle for most companies. I mean, it's, yeah, this is an opportunity, but is it going to take me, is it going to problem, make it a problem to do my other business? Is mm-hmm. it going to distract me? Is it going to make my delivery more complicated? I guess, how do you balance or how did you, I mean, it sounds like you said no for a while. So in the beginning, it was clearly like, yeah, we need to stick to our knitting. Let's not get involved in that now. But that at some point you did. I mean, I guess, what was the tipping point? Was it the number of clients that were reaching out? Was it the prices they were willing to pay? How did you decide to finally, okay, we're going to do it? So that's actually a really, really good question. At that time, we I was still with my sort of founding partner or founding mm-hmm. co-partner or whatever. And, um, you know, for the longest time, we, we just kept saying, no, we really wanted to focus on growing the productized service side. It was, you know, growing exponentially every year. And we were like, we like you just said, you know, we don't want to divert too much energy away from that. We don't want to spread ourselves too thin. But then we... We thought about it and we we're like, well, we're already doing, we're already creating a lot of the components that would make up a marketing campaign. Mm-hmm. Let us see if we can fill the gaps by hiring, say, one or two strategists that can tie everything together. And um, and initially, we made huge mistakes with that. You know, we took on clients that were way too small, for example, and um, and this is a problem that is absolutely rampant in the SEO and marketing industry is that people will promise businesses that they can get them fantastic results, especially with SEO for say, oh, you know, yeah. 300 or 400 or $500 a month. And then you, you just can't deliver what the client expects for that amount. And so that was really our initial struggle was that catch 22 game of saying, well, we need clients to have bigger budgets in order to do better work. But in order to get those clients, we need to have the better work to present as like case studies, et cetera, et cetera, you know? And so it took quite a lot of work to basically build the systems and build the infrastructure and get that that sort of authority, if you will, to be able to onboard those kind of clients. But what was interesting is that because of our productized service business, we ended up finding that we were working with a lot of smaller agencies that actually couldn't handle bigger jobs. And so what we started to do is to actually put the word out that we would give them commissions and, and those kind of things if they referred yeah. those bigger clients out to us. And that worked like a charm. So it's interesting. So you're kind of servicing these smaller agencies to begin with mm-hmm. and then then realize that there was a new need, which is they couldn't service the big account. So then you come in with an offering that kind of handles the biggest account and you make that, you monetize that for them because otherwise they were just letting it go. Either they were letting it go or they were trying to do it and failing and then it would hurt their reputation and you know exactly. they just wouldn't do a good job. So now it's like, hey, look, instead of taking this risk or letting it go, throw it over to us. We'll give you a cut on the on the profit side of it. So, you know, it's mm-hmm. kind of a win, win, win. I mean, the, the client gets better service. The agency gets more profit. You know, you get to expand your offering. Exactly. And that yeah. was that was one of the key models that we then later used to really scale up the, the agency. We actually started to build sort of, uh, trying to find the right word here, commission only sales opportunities where we basically would find people that actually were capable of running SEO campaigns, but that were kind of in in loss for a better word over it. And we said, well, you have authority. You you almost naturally attract the type of client that we want to work with. Why don't you become an introducer for us? And instead of paying uh, you one big commission, what we'll do is we'll pay you a smaller ongoing commission and you stay as kind of like an account manager, but the only pay that you get is that ongoing commission, right? So they have an interest in continuing to manage that portfolio, but they also present themselves as kind of like a 
a first line of defense when you have a really clingy client that wants to call you every day they get that call rather than than my guys that are supposed to be working on campaigns and so that was a little bit tricky to set up but once we had ironed it out it became the sales machine that only costs us money if it's making us money that's an interesting one because i think that kind of lead you know kind of lead account strategy is hard for for most companies because it does it takes up a lot of time or it potentially can take up a lot of time and and it's hard to scale i mean if you're if you're doing your own you know if you're hiring your own salespeople you know it's it's hard because you've got to pay base salaries you've got to pay mm-hmm. commissions especially in the beginning it can be really make or break for a company to really get an investment but in this case you know it's while like i'm sure in the end you're paying a bit of a premium sure it ends up being uh, you know, very low risk and much more scalable in terms of, you know, if you just look at the business model, right? Because you can always go out and find other influencers mm-hmm. and, you know, you've already kind of got the deal model structured and set up and you just onboard them and, you know, if they like it, they do more. If they don't, they bow out and you just cycle through them. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant sort of lead generation strategy and then allows you to focus on what you do really well, which is developing and running the campaigns. Exactly. And that was really our goal all along was that, you know, we understood and, and especially from my previous roles, I really understood that if you hire a, um, a, you know, a new sales operator, the lead time for them to really be functional and for them to be getting you a return on your investment yeah. is quite long. And if you're a small business, that time can be really vital, right? And the money more, more importantly. Yeah. Oh, excellent. And in terms of, I'm curious, as you've looked at these influencers, what have, of their particular quality, I mean, you mentioned this thing of that they were kind of over it. <laughs> um, like, is that the kind of the real kind of condition that you're looking for? And how do you find that? Like, what, how did that serve you? Or how, once you kind of found that kind of attribute of this, I'll call it a customer, it's really kind of a, a referral, lead referral kind of person, like how did that affect how you approached them, how you set up the agreement, like how you structured your service? Give me a little insight on how you really tailored that. Sure. So the the first thing that we'd always look out for is to actually try and find people who's almost like whose work or work ethic we could see from the outside, right? So in our business, that's of course a little bit easier because everything's online. And so I can, mm-hmm. you know, I can look at your, your website or I can look at the, um, the, the work that you, that you're talking about, the questions that you ask in the, for example, in the Facebook groups or the forums or whatever. And, um, and then we would just try to identify the people that are either dealing with a lot of small projects where we think that they might be getting the odd bigger project that they can't handle or vice versa. There are also people that deal with much bigger projects than we do, where we know that the clients that are in our sweet spot would be too small for them. And so we would look for that Mm. and then start the conversation by being quite blunt and saying, you know, this is kind of what we're looking at. And here's how much you could be making from these people basically passively and is that something you'd be interested in and then basically what we what we do is we train them up to do like a lead qualification process where we want them to have the initial conversation with any lead that they get so Mm -hmm. in order to weed people out that are not going to fit our sort of criteria and then we'll jump on a second call with that lead where we start looking more at the numbers and we always try to close them and all of that but ultimately after that point we do all the work and they do the majority of the communication and um what we found is that it, it really just they're always going to be partners that that suck there's there's mm-hmm. you know there's just no doubt about that but what we what we found is that there are quite a few that just amazing that naturally have much more charisma for the sales process than they do to actually sit there behind a computer for however many hours, you know, just just getting the work done. And so they just were so suitable. But what the most important part was, was to find people that actually understand the type of marketing that we do. And that was really the, the main point of it, was to not just hire someone that's good on the phone trying to sell stuff, but somebody that can actually explain it to the lead. Yeah, it could be kind of a, a strategic advisor. Mm-hmm. to them and, and then then use your kind of the engine that you have to be able to then execute on it. 
I'm curious. I always find that as businesses grow, their kind of limiting constraints or the challenges will flip on them a little bit. And it sounds like, you know, as you kind of solve the lead generation or the client facing kind of side of this, what became the next kind of challenge for you? Like, as it was like, okay, we seem to have that figured out. Like, where did that issue, where did, where did the constraint or where did the problem shift on you in terms of what the next kind of thing was that was going to hold you back in terms of building the business? Sure. So the hardest thing was we, we started off totally remote, right? So our team was was completely remote. And that was more for uh, budget reasons than anything else. Mm -hmm. And I think about three or three and a half years into the business, we then decided to actually get a physical office and, you know, kind of scale that way. And what we found was that our biggest issue with doing that was that we were really struggling to find the talent that we needed in a hyper-local space. And the reason for that was that, especially in the location that our office is in, which is in Brighton, which is just one hour south of London, Mm -hmm. we were always competing with the big London firms. And so let's say that, you know, there's a uh, an SEO strategist that's got five years experience, they would probably be getting 10 or 20,000 pounds a year more just by taking the train into London mm. instead of instead of working locally. And so it was just insanely expensive for us. Yeah. And so what we had to do is we had to change our vision there a little bit to basically keep the management structure here in the UK and then hire all over the globe for the right kind of person instead of the right place. Yeah. Well, and and, yeah, I mean, that changes the game because once you do that, now you're, you have a global talent base. (laughs) Exactly. And, and so it opens you up to much more affordable labor, first of all, much higher, much higher quality because, you know, not even just talking about internationally, but just alone within your own country being able to hire someone that's across the country opens up so much more opportunity than just looking in, say, a 10-mile radius of your office. Yeah. Um, and so that was a huge game changer for us. And, you know, now we work with a bunch of people in the US, in the UK. We've got a bunch of expats that live out in Asia. And it's, sure. it's just, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, the companies you service and kind of the strategies you use, I mean, if you're a service-based company out there these days, you know, looking to grow and scale, how, how do you look at, in terms of the services that you offer, how do you help companies? What, what, is the, what is the value that you generate for them and how can companies really kind of consider this as a potential solution? Sure. Well, so the majority of uh, companies that we work with, US-based, we do help a a fair share of um, service-based businesses, local, national, uh, and then we help a lot of online businesses as well, so like e-commerce stores and, and sort of other productized services and stuff like that. But the really the most important thing that we try to help people with initially is to try and understand actually where should they spend their budget on when it comes to digital marketing, because that tends to be the hardest decision-making process and also something that the majority of marketing agencies either don't care enough about or aren't honest enough about. Because what you'll find is a lot of times, if you contact an SEO agency, they will tell you that running an SEO campaign for whoever the company is, is the best idea. And if you contact a Facebook ad agency, they will tell you that Facebook ads is the best thing to do, <laughs> etc. Yeah. And the, the problem is, though, that when, it, especially when it comes to smaller businesses, so, you know, say the two, three man trade business, for example, that just wants to get a couple more jobs to to slowly grow, maybe put another truck on the road, whatever it might be. It's really important to make that decision before you start investing your hard-earned money, especially because of the impact that that investment will have on the business as, as well as on everything else. And so the first thing that we always try to do is to try and identify what are what are the needs of that business and how long can they invest that amount of money to see results without it, you know, having a major effect on the business. And so, for example, if let's say, let's just say it's a local plumbing business, let's just Mm -hmm. keep things simple. And that local plumbing business comes to us and say, look, we're doing fantastic. Our books are busy. We are 
only now becoming aware of how important SEO is. We have no immediate needs, but we want to start investing into it to build something for the future. Well, fantastic. Well, we can work on that campaign. And if they only start seeing results in six months time, because they haven't ever done anything on their website, nothing is going to change for them. They are a okay. But on the contrary, if that same plumbing business came to us and said, look, we're a startup. We don't have an existing client base. We're absolutely desperate to get some work. We something has has to happen quick and in a hurry, we would never recommend them to go with SEO because of the lead time that it has and yeah. because of the limited budget that they might have as well. We would then say, well, you know, you should probably consider maybe um, Google ads or Facebook ads or whatever the strategy might be, depending on the product or service that they're offering. And what we found is that that honest approach has helped us build incredible relationships, get a lot more referrals, yeah. and um, also keep a happy client base. Because ultimately, of course, we could say, yep, SEO is the way to go for you. <laughs> yeah. we, you I'll know, take your money. <laughs> exactly. Take yeah. the money. But the problem is the churn rate would just go through the roof because yeah. they're not going to get the results. And, that, and we honestly know that. And so does every other SEO company if they were honest about it. Yeah. Uh, and so that's really, really helped us scale things out from there. Yeah. And is there any like, you know, like industry or situation or geography, any, anything that you've learned that this is, there's kind of untapped potential or, um, you know, that, that SEO is still, or is particularly useful and versus other industries that, you know, maybe it's, you know, it's a highly developed market and it's really competitive and anything, anything that you've noticed there? Sure. So, I mean, especially for service businesses that are in smaller cities, I think that SEO is still really, really important because it's a much less competitive market. So you're going to see results quite quickly and you're actually likely to dominate your town because, you know, when you're looking at cities of say, you know, 150 to 500,000 people, the likelihood of there being hundreds and hundreds of businesses doing the same thing as you do that are doing their marketing right is very, very low. And so you can probably dominate the first page of Google and, you know, really take home the bacon. Now, the things that are really difficult, for example, are industries like locksmithing and roofing. This has become very, very difficult. Legal, it depends on what kind of um, legal services they provide. But I would say that SEO isn't going anywhere. The only difference is that we always recommend to really look at all of the things that you could be doing look at the budget that you have available and then see, you know, how to best deploy that. In some cases, it might turn out that it makes more sense to start off with paid advertising just to get the ROI in yeah. and then utilize the extra money that that's generating to go onto an SEO campaign for the long haul. Yeah, it, it always, what I find is that depending on the companies, kind of where they are in their growth, you know, if they're early stage, mid stage, and also what they're trying to do next, like if trying to break into a market, a new geography, mm -hmm. like all these things come into play and you kind of, you do need to kind of assess all the different strategies you have in terms of lead generation and marketing and then, you know, make sure that you're finding the best one. But honestly, things change. I, I find that about every six months or so, sometimes every quarter, you need to kind of assess, like, is this strategy still working? You know, no. if it is, great, let's double down for another quarter. But if not, how do we take a step back and say, hey, look, maybe it's time for a new strategy or a new approach on this. And then I think that's where things can change, right? Your position can change, what you're trying to generate in terms of leads, what you're willing to invest, what your horizon is, like all those things will change the models that you can apply. A hundred percent. And I think yeah. that what's super important for businesses to understand that a lot of them are still struggling with is that Right now, we're looking at really three main ways of advertising, especially service businesses, especially local businesses, which is, you know, PPC, so that's Google ads, then uh, Facebook ads, and lastly, SEO. And then obviously, you've got all the traditional stuff like print and, and media buying and stuff like that. But when you look at those three, you have three different intent levels. And that's something that a lot of people are still struggling to understand yeah. is that PPC, so Google Ads, means that somebody has searched for a query that you're able to service. And that's why usually the cost is quite high because you're, you know, you're supposedly only getting clicks from people that are actually searching for your, your product or service. So, yep. you know, if I'm a roofer in New York, then I would probably service keywords like roofer New York, etc. And so that's the highest intent level. And then you've got Facebook ads, which is the polar opposite of that, where you're not really 
on Facebook to buy anything or to find a business. You're on Facebook to, you know, watch cat videos or whatever. And so we're, <laughs> we're, we're disruption marketing. We're breaking up the flow of somebody scrolling through their newsfeed. And that's why yeah. it's so important there to have great creatives and to break, to have something that is you know, attention grabbing. And that's why you'll find that businesses that understand storytelling will do best usually, right? So for example, I don't know, a, a beauty studio that's using like an image of a really hairy leg or something to grab people's attention because it's so grotesque or whatever yeah. it might, you know what I'm saying. I love it. Yep. And, but then with SEO, we're kind of doing everything because we're trying to rank our website, but we have this opportunity because it, because we can create the content on the website, we have this opportunity to cover all intent levels. We can actually try to understand the user journey of whatever service that we provide and try to cover all aspects. So for example, if I'm a roofing company, then I could create content on my website that covers how to actually identify damage to the roof or how to identify when I need a new roof or how to scope up the cost of a, an extension in the roof. And so by doing that, I'm now covering the intent of people that are just starting their journey that are trying to understand whether they need a roofer instead of the people that already know it and that are making the call to make a purchase. And yeah. every business can do that. There's a fantastic example of that. There's a company called TransferWise that are an international money transfer service. And when you look at their blog, they have a couple of million words of content on their blog. And what they cover is literally everything to do with the lifestyle of somebody that may need to transfer money at some point, including things like research on how to find the right school to go and study abroad, because yeah. they know that when that student arrives abroad for their year away, they will call mom and dad to send them some money. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's great. It's like kind of thinking through, okay, what are the precessors to that event? And how do I create content for that to gain their attention? Because I know, or there's a high likelihood, or there's a high correlation between people that have that problem that end up having our problem. And so can we, can we seed this appropriately? Yeah, it's a great strategy. Absolutely. Jonathan, this has been a pleasure. If people want to find out more about you, about the work that you do, what's the best way to get that information? The easiest way is to go to seobutler.com. You can find everything there, including my contact details. And um, yeah, I'm always really, really happy to chat shop and uh, problem solve and, and figure things out. And yeah, thank you so much for having me as well. A pleasure. Yeah, it's absolutely a pleasure. I'll put the link in the show notes here so people can click there and get that information. Yeah, thank you for taking the time today. Great insights. I think you know service companies always struggle with this, and I think you've given some really good things to think about and understand where to apply it, how to apply it, and so I really appreciate it. It's been an honor. Thank you, Bruce. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter.